Okay, morning all, and uh, thanks very much for the invite. Thanks, Paul, for the invite, and thanks for coming up with the exam questions for our panel, which was really helpful. I'm an academic. Um, I, that proves that I'm good at exams. Uh, let's see whether that still holds true. Now, I feel like I'm not, I've not judged this event properly. I was at a different conference yesterday, and it was about impact, and it was with loads of impact professionals from the university sector, hence the suit and I'm feeling a little bit overdressed and a little bit uncomfortable as a result. I'm also really struck by talking to some of you before this session and hearing uh, the response to the plenary that I've just heard, because I missed the Google talk last night, about the, the breadth of issues that we're trying to discuss today. Um, I think Paul's designed this session quite well to try and find a way into that. I think that should we be striving, should museums be striving to be digital innovators? I think I can answer that. I like that. It's a bit like you know, the famous Winston Churchill Oxford entrance exam question where he answered yes or no. I can never remember which it was. Or was it Cambridge? Anyway, um, it, yes, of course you should be striving to be digital innovators, but the, there's much more to what you do than just digital. I love the observation in response to the last plenary that actually um, we want work that's real world, it's born real world. I, I'm an art historian by training, I'm an 18th century art historian, that's what I do, that's why I love museums, I love objects. And actually as I teach students and as I'm involved in digital projects and I'll talk about some of them in a moment, I think that's what a lot of audiences want, uh, that the more the digital takes off and is embedded in our life, the greater the hunger for the authentic and for the object itself. So yeah, we should be striving to be digital pioneers, but doing it in a way that adds value to the core work that we've, all, we've been doing for generations and that we, I hope, um, aspire to continue to do. Then I was asked to think about how does leading edge, I'm very visual in my imagination because I'm an art historian, so I prefer the leading edge to the cutting edge because that makes me think of blood. So the leading edge digital development, how does it align with the unique resources of museums? Well, the key unique resources of museums are of course the holdings that they um, store, they preserve, they curate, they explain, they share with their users. Uh, but the other key resource is the expertise of the staff. And I don't have any reservation in saying that museums are really well situated to be digitally innovative because of the combination of those elements. Incredible resources to share, as in their collections, incredible human resources to enable that, and a real understanding of audiences and their needs. And that's one of the reasons that so many digital companies work with my team and I'll talk now about the kind of thing that we do because how, do mu how can museums engage in innovation is really the heart of what I'm going to talk about. So I, as I mentioned, 18th century art historian, I'm the co-director of the Digital Humanities Hub at the University of Birmingham. My other co-director is an archaeologist, so obviously we lead a multi-million pound digital project. Now, what we do at the Hub is we run a series of projects and we're a small team and we're really probably more like enablers. There are elements of research to what we do, but as a small team, we work in what the EU very inelegantly calls triple helix. So three sectors working together, the academy, the cultural sector, and then small businesses, SMEs. So I'm not going to talk so much about what we do with this ERDF project. That is our core work at the moment because it's our main bit of funding. We, but I'm just very briefly, we work a lot in collaboration. We l run knowledge exchange events. We call them CAKE, Collaboration and Knowledge Exchange. It's an acronym. There's always an acronym, isn't there? But there is actual CAKE. And the three sectors, I think, come back partly for the CAKE as well as the Collaboration and Knowledge Exchange. And they share problems, they talk about issues, they talk about projects. We offer business assists to SMEs, 
um, and we develop multi-user, multi-touch solutions um, with our partners. And here are some examples of some of them out in the, um, what we would call, or my coders would call, out in the wild, which is to say a museum. <laughs> they can be wild, but yeah. Anyway, so the, I think this is quite an intriguing example of how museums are really well positioned to be innovative. Because what we found in developing this kind of content, and I was going to show you a film, but it doesn't seem to be compatible with this Mac of a multi-user, multi-touch table in action. What we found developing this stuff is that actually our colleagues in museums are totally essential, partly in terms of offering us content, but also in terms of curating content and how they think about users' experience. And here we're designing for 360 degree interfaces, and this is the first time we've ever had that. TVs have tops and bottoms, so do theatres, and um, so do uh, film, uh, cinema screens. So we're designing an interface where people can approach from any angle, and we found that the museums are really, really helpful. But what we're doing there is working in collaboration across sectors, and that's at the core of what we do all the time. Now, I'm very aware now I've probably got, what, three minutes, Paul? If you say so. All right, I've maybe got five minutes. <laughs> no, you said three. No, I've, I'm at, yeah, I didn't tell you what base I was using. Um, so, yeah, look, we work in collaboration, but probably, I think the most exciting project that we do isn't really the RDF, where there's big money and there's big shiny bits of kit that end up in the Library of Birmingham and Birmingham Museum Trust and so on and so forth. It's a project that I run with Ross Parry, who's here, he's my co-investigator at HRC. It's the Collaborative Arts Triple Helix with CAF. We just thought we'd remember that, because it's first name. And what we found with this project, what we actually set out to do with this project was to give very small amounts of money to teams that are drawn from three sectors. So you get our cultural organization, an academic, and an SME, and they each get £4,000 when they form a triplet like that uh, to develop a digital prototype. And it's just this small amount of seed money that allows these people to sit down, start to talk to each other, start to explore what they could um, do, and they come up, have come up with some astonishing projects, which I don't think in any case anyone who formed a triplet arrived with an idea that ended up being seen all the way through. So are museums who are part of this process, are they good homes for innovation? Yeah. Are they really receptive to talking to other sectors? Yes. Um, but I, I think this is now, I'm way off what I thought I was going to talk about, but then I didn't know what was going to be said in the plenary. So, but I'm thinking about what just came out in the questions. And I, I agree that the challenge is about um, how do you embed digital in behaviours within the cultural sector? And I don't think everybody has to do it. I really don't. I really don't think it's necessary. Um, but I do think that in the world of the funding, there's big money available for you to go to. Um, and, yeah, I agree with the comment that came out that you then project ends, you fall off the end of a cliff. It's how do you build knowledge and understanding of the digital and the value it could add within your organization and make it sustainable? Well, I actually think the simple answer is to start with really small pots of money. I don't think the funding bodies are very good at that. I think they tend to think big. They think big problem, big challenge, big opportunity, big chunk of money. And what Ross and I have found is a small bit of money can have a real impact in terms of embedding the way that organizations think about the digital and build relationships, build collaborations that are much more likely to be sustainable because they've got the key ingredient in them, which is trust. You know, actually, the partners trust each other. Museums are, definitely have something exciting to bring to this party. SMEs want to engage with what museums know and with what academics know, but we don't have to spend a fortune um, trying to move forward in, the, in terms of dealing with the way that we deal with innovation in the digital. Right, that was a long three minutes.
You can see why I don't use Twitter. I'm done. Thanks very much. Morning. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to talk. None of this is going to be new or sexy or exciting or interesting because Richard's pretty much done all the work for me. Uh, but I was asked to give a case study. So like Richard, I'll push the boundary and do two. Uh, it'll still take 10 minutes, I promise. And uh, these are all the tattoos I need to have for people who fund uh, where I currently work. Uh, last year, I worked at the University of St. Andrews. And within their collection, uh, 112,000 objects, there's this chemistry glassware collection that's internationally recognized. Here's an example of um, three of the specimens. Um, chemistry, a confusing subject, something that appeared in the uh, 19th century as a, as a topic itself. But the university, up until the late 20th century, employed a glass blower so that chemists could actually control what kind of volumes, shapes, sizes they were wanting to experiment with. This, to me, is a fine example as to why university museums can be called digital pioneers and certainly have the tools to do so. So using two case studies, one at St Andrews and one at the University of Worcester, where I am now, I want to highlight the reasons or the ingredients or the purposes that museums based in universities can bring to the sector. The the main museum at uh, St Andrews is called Musa, and they were approached by the School of Computer and Human Interaction. Um, these, it was explained to me this morning, are, are often called guerrilla type IT agencies. They came to us direct, they wanted a tourism partner, they wanted a venue that has a lot of tourists coming. So with a 36,000 audience a year, that's a good, a good starting point. And they also had an SME, Interface 3, who were based in Edinburgh, and wanted to work with the university. So they came up with a project, and what did they bring to us immediately? Well, they bring resources from outside the sector, and it may not have been gold or cash, but they bring expertise and research, and I'll talk about some of them in a second. The small, medium-sized business gets huge amount of kudos. Remember, most of these are less than 10 years old, probably less than five years old, to work with an institution that's got heritage, got history, and got talent behind it can be a very attractive thing and can push them a little bit more. And the university gets, gets the audience and gets a chance to share their theories and practice them. With that research, the museum gets a good partner, but the actual visitor is beginning to feel more value. Um, we all know that the majority of visitors to museums, particularly university museums, do come from a much more intellectual background. Um, and whilst we try and work hard to increase the diversity, if they are coming, if they're in the audience and they're being approached by a master's student asking them questions about their experiences and what they want to see digitally, they're going to feel much more valued and hopefully are going to come back and want to try and test that. Um, and the university gets this captive audience that is so important to making their um, uh, ideas work. If you're working in the universities, you all know that there's these emails come around on a constant basis looking for psychology students, we'll give you 10 pounds, come and sit this exam, come and do these sleep tests for us. It's constant. So we're giving them that without that problem. Uh, master student came, she did a survey, she came up with ideas along with us, along with the staff, and came up with prototypes, very low tech things, and then was able to test them again. And within that, they get a great short iteration period so she can test her hypothesis and help her with her work. The company gets a chance to test its market knowledge in a condensed field, and the museum gets this opportunity to be more positive about innovation, as well as staff training and staff um, buy into these things, because it is exciting. Sometimes it can be very, very sexy to touch these new things that nobody else knows how they work. I then went to the University of Worcester, a very small museum, 10,000 students, fast, one of the fastest growing in the UK, but has a very, very um, short history as a university, just nine years. I was approached by uh, a lecturer in the game design module. That's part of the uh, computing degree, and he wanted his students to use our small but perfectly formed gallery as a sandpit to come and over the course of one semester, these five teams were to create a game. So we created 
um, with the lecturer a brief. We gave them an audience. We gave them boundaries. And we sent them off. They came to us with questions. We gave them research. We're trying to give them a real life experience here. We're the client. So what do they give us? They give us fresh ideas. What does the university get? They get access to this audience um, and access to the content. And the student has this real world experience and an experience of what heritage is all about. Here's some of the examples. Um, Richard, there's blood involved, so be careful. Uh, they all approached it, all five, in very different ways. And that, I think, is something that heritage organizations, museums, can be quite one-minded and one-directional. Uh, so the fresh ideas, I couldn't believe how random and how innovative they were. These ones used hum uh, humor to help. Uh, if you didn't treat the patient well, you were the one who lost a life, not the patient. <laughs> Doesn't seem like the real world there, but it keeps you engaged. This. Uh, game was much more frenetic. Um, and again, you've got lots of patients trying to deal them at the same time. But you can see a little corner of Winston Churchill there. Um, again, second mention, that's not too bad. Uh, and he was announcing um, ticker tape kind of events in history, events in medical science, medical advancements that you could then use within the game. So there's surreptitious learning that some of these students put in there. We didn't say it had to be educational. Um, and this one was a quest game. Um, being a 240-year-old building, there's lots of ghost stories, uh, and being a former hospital. And they used the ghost as the, um, as the enemy. The final one here, this is a, an example of un unintended benefits, because one of the students on this project is seeking to take it forward for his third year project. So actually, at the end of it, we may still get a product out of it for our time and our uh, content but he's learning all the way along, and we're giving him this real feedback as a client. So the final thing uh, Richard touched on as well is this relationships idea. I believe that this world would be useless without relationships, no matter how important you are, how much money you have. If you don't trust that person to do something, it's not going to get done properly. And the relationships that you build from very, very small projects like this, like these ones, up until the big ones, all leads to um, a positive future for university museums being digital pioneers. I'm happy to talk about any of these uh, privately or afterwards, um, but that's all I have to say for now. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Danny Birdshaw from Welcome Collection. We're not a university museum, um, but I'm going to give you something like a kind of a, a case study, maybe, in a particular kind of innovation that we did. We're a small... Um, London-based museum, uh, we're getting a bit larger later this year, give or take a staircase, um, dedicated to interdisciplinary crossovers between science, um, art and medicine, and founded around the collection and legacy of Sir Henry Wellcome. So here's one of our permanent exhibits, actually all in storage at the moment while we refurbish. This is Medicine Man. Um, we also have temporary exhibitions and an events programme. This is an on-gallery event here, a picture of it taking place part of our Superhuman exhibition in 2012, which is about uh, human enhancement and kind of uh, set up to take place alongside the Paralympics. Now, between 2011 and 2013, we had a concerted period of commissioning games to support exhibitions. Um, during that time, so these are all things that are born digital, intended to kind of sort of live as digital products, not kind of to be played in the gallery, but mostly to be played online and outside the gallery. And during this period, we made six games, a variety of platforms, HTML5, Flash, iOS, and collectively, these have been played around the world over seven million times. But this is kind of um, mostly down to two of these, which I'll tell you about in a second. So in 2010, we approached the kind of the, the issue, the kind of desire to make video games with a manifesto of sorts to explain ourselves within the organisation and to the agencies that we approached. There are assumptions about the relationships between brand and games, um, between education and games, um, that we wanted to make clear that we were avoiding or exploring alternatives to. So we didn't want kind of Tamagotchi-style games with correct choices, the kind of sort of clicks in between animations, kind of dry educational outcomes. We did want to make games that appealed to adults every bit as much as kids. To put it another way, we didn't want to chocolate coat broccoli. And this was a kind of big starting point for us. This was kind of a no-no. We were not creating fun in order to deliver serious learning. We were creating learning through fun. 
So I'm going to take you through quickly through kind of sort of four of the games that we've made and then some of the kind of the, the rationale and outcome. So this is High Tea. High Tea was probably our breakthrough success. It was commissioned to accompany an exhibition on recreational drug use. Um, and it took the British opium trade in the Pearl Delta as its basis and made the player a British opium trader taking part in the triangular trade of tea, cash and opium between Bengal, the UK and China. High concept, buy opium, sell opium, buy tea. All historically very real. He exposed a dirty moments in British history, and it was extremely popular. It's played over three million times, mostly through portals like Congregate and Armour Games. Our next portal success was Axon, fast-paced arcade-type game built to accompany an exhibition on brains. Um, and it took the neural growth of the fetal brain as a starting point. It puts the player in charge of growing this central nerve fibre of a brain cell, the axon, in response by chasing these proton triggers. And it's based on kind of real, the real research of uh, scientists at King's. And this one was played over four million times, again, mostly through flash portals, but it has a, a shorter play time, so it's easier. The high T takes about 20 minutes to complete this one. You can bomb out of in 30 seconds or under. Um, the next thing we did was something completely different. It's called Magic in Modern London. It was a, uh, a geolocative treasure hunt for the iPhone, structured around the collection of an Edwardian folklorist, Edward Lovett, his collection of amulets. And the app basically allows you to explore London through the hopes and fears of early 20th century Londoners collecting amulets along the way. So you kind of your phone tells you when you enter a kind of an enchanted area, and you have to find a particular location within that enchanted area and retrieve the amulet. And this will tell you something about the sometimes kind of quite surprising health-related fears of uh, people at the beginning of the 20th century. Last year, we released Who's the Pest? This was released both as a flash game for portals and on iOS devices, and it takes inspiration from a series of events that we had about the ecological relationship between humans and insects. Um, it's the world's first eat-em-up cabbage defence puzzler. Yeah? Um, that's innovation for you. Um, pitting humans against ants, but the player's forced to take first the human side and then the ant side in order to kind of sort of promote awareness of the kind of ecological relationships at work. The key for all these games is collaborating on content, often with the same people who were working on the exhibition. So here we have Mike Jay on the left who worked uh, on high, high Society, which High Tea accompanied, um, is a cultural historian. The art historians Marius Quint and the neuroscientist Richard Wingate at the top, who works on Axon. Um, the writer and technologist Alex Butterworth at the bottom, who worked on Magic in, Bundle, Magic in Modern London. And entomologist Erica McAllister and Paul Eggleston, who worked on Who's the Pest. We also work with talented games agencies, and two in particular here we have preloaded and something else. So people had experience working with educational organisations and broadcasters in delivering exactly the kind of experience that we wanted to deliver, which was games that kind of put the learning at the heart of the play. Um, we've been evaluating what we do as we go along, so we did a kind of particular evaluation of high tea in 2011, in which we looked at everything from the Google Analytics to focused phone interviews. Um, and last year we did a kind of a larger piece of work with the agency story things, um, looking at kind of overall experience of the games. One of the surprising things that we learned um, was that piracy is a particularly effective form of distribution for digital games. So we put these games out on the internet and allow people basically to kind of play them wherever they want, take them, put them on their own sites. And you can see that dark green triangle on the lower graph is the amount of plays that we had for high tea on the site that we set up for it, and it's about 3%. About the other half, so the, of, the of the two larger halves, one of those is places we put it, so like congregating new grounds, places we knew where people took games, and the other half was places that people just took it and ripped it off. So we'd look at the GM and we'd go, oh my god, they're playing that game in Czechoslovakia on this Czech game site, and we can barely understand what the, the way that they framed it, but they're playing the game and we're confident that the kind of the, the, the thing that we want to happen is happening. Um, and so that, that was a kind of sort of huge revelation for us that kind of you don't build uh, digital games as a honeypot to your own site, but kind of build them so that they're out in the world and people are playing them there. Um, in more detail, when we did the work with Story Things, we looked at player experiences and we looked at kind of look really dive deeply into the data to say what an average player experience of one of these games looked like. Um, so kind of, you know, for the Flash version of Who's the Pest, again, slightly less than high tea, but 66% played on non-welcome sites. And part of this is feeding into when we begin thinking about commissioning again, um, how, what kind of behaviours we target. There's a lot of codes. No, basically, nobody knows anything about a casual games playing audience <laughs> because it moves so fast. It moves kind of sort of, you know, kind of ridiculously fast that new devices come out every month, new kind of thing. One of the things that you can think about, do people play games on their screens at work? Do people play games? 
on their phones on the way to work and helping us understand the behaviour of the people who play this game, help us understand the behaviour of people who might want to play our games and therefore kind of choose which technologies and types of games that we might make to target those people. This is the killer quote. This is, this is come. So this, high tea was played on portals a lot. Um, these are kind of sort of places where people come to play games, places like, I think this is from uh, Congregate. And what was particularly gratifying for us was that the kind of the discussion about these games, um, the discussion about the games moved from the usual kind of like how to get the high score, how to game, etc., and onto the subject matter. And this was like, so in a games playing portal where people are normally kind of talking about, you know, their high scores, they kind of suddenly people are talking about a really dodgy episode in British imperial history and we're like, win. Um, and this is kind of, you know, the, 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 the killer thing, and this is, I swear this is not a plant, it's just we found this comment in the stream of comments. How come I only understood what I'd seen in a museum after playing this game? We understand that kind of, you know, one of the purposes for museums of making digital media like this is there are different learning styles, there are different experiences, and sometimes to play a thing is to understand it more than to look at an object. And if you've got the kind of the right, you know, if you've got the right content approach, if you're making it kind of not chocolate covered broccoli, but if you're if you're putting the content into the game so that the playing is experiencing the thing that we're kind of that we're interested in then you can get, I think, you know, that's not a universal result by any means, but kind of, how come I understood it, understood it after I played this game? There's a few of us who have been working in educational games and um, museum games in particular in order to kind of share a, a kind of disparate and fragmented uh, research and practice field. We set up a wiki, um, which you see in the middle, the kind of sort of the museumgames.pbworks.com. Um, if you want to... Um, if you want to kind of contribute or learn, contribute to that debate, kind of research what's going on there, you can, you can visit that. Um, you can play all these games from Welcome Collection at the URL there, welcomecollection.org slash play. Uh, and I'm very happy. I'm always, this has always been a kind of sort of learning and growing experience for us. As we commission games, we learn from kind of other people creating learning experiences, other people creating games, and we're kind of really keen to sort of maintain dialogue. We're working on a game. Um, with a bunch of graduates from National Film and Television School at the moment, um, based around our, our forthcoming show on forensic medicine, so that should be out next year. Thank you. <laughs>